Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the National Center for Rural Road Safety's February webinar. We're going to give everyone just a few more moments to get logged in and then we'll get started. Thank you for joining us for the National Center for Rural Road Safety's February webinar entitled Road Ecology, Safety for Four-Legged Pedestrians. My name is Carolyn Clouser. I'm with the National Center for Rural Road Safety, and I will be helping moderate this webinar today. Um, so I'm going to run through a few logistics before we get started with the presentation. The webinar will be 90 minutes long. We are recording the webinar, and this recording will be available on our website in the webinar archive at ruralsafetycenter.org, and that recording is generally uploaded within a week. Closed captioning is available for the webinar today. The link was emailed out to everyone who requested it when they registered. However, if you still need that link, it is available in the chat pod and on the slide here. Um, we will be waiting until the end of the presentation today for questions. However, you can use that Q&A pod on the side of your screen to submit questions to the presenter at any time. You can also use that Q&A pod um, to let us know if you're having any technical difficulties during the webinar today. There is a PDF copy of today's presentation available for download in the handouts pod on the side of your screen. Um, we would like to ask that you please complete the survey that will pop up at the end of today's webinar. The link to that survey will also be emailed out to you with the webinar recording um, if you would like to complete that survey at a later time. And finally, certificates of completion um, are available for this webinar. Those generally come out about a month after the webinar, and those are emailed to you from our events at ruralsafetycenter.org email account. That email will also include an application to apply for CEUs through Montana State University. And as a reminder, CEUs are free to apply for, but if you need a formal transcript from the university, that costs $25. So with that, we are thankful to have Dr. Marcel Hauser join us today. Dr. Hauser is a research ecologist with 30 years of experience, specialized in road ecology since 1995. He has conducted research in Europe, North America, South America, and Asia. His focus is on the ecological impacts of transportation infrastructure, as well as mitigation measures and at reducing these impacts. Most of his research relates to of reducing large mammal vehicle collisions, providing safe crossing opportunities for wildlife, and cost benefit analyses regarding the implementation of mitigation measures. While he is originally from the Netherlands, he has been in Montana since 2002, where he works for the Western Transportation Institute at Montana State University. So the goal for our webinar today is that once you've completed this webinar, you will have an understanding of wildlife vehicle collision mitigation. And to achieve this goal, we will learn to Describe the effects of roads and traffic on wildlife. Understand the difference in departure point based on human safety versus biological conservation. Understand the mitigation hierarchy, avoid, mitigate, compensate. Understand the need to formulate goals and objectives so that the effectiveness can be evaluated and declare success versus no success. And understand that there is a cost to doing nothing and that thinking about cost benefit ratios is more useful than thinking only about costs. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Marcel. You can pull up his PowerPoint. Thank you for the introduction. I'll uh, get the screen set up now. All right, well, welcome. I'm to talk to you about road ecology today. But before I start, I'd like to acknowledge that it's not just me who does this research. I'll actually draw from uh, the experience and efforts of many of my colleagues as well. This is what I look like on a good day. I'm a research ecologist for the Western Transportation Institute at Montana State University. And we do contract research, uh, typically for transportation agencies natural resource management agencies. 
but we also provide educational opportunities and specifically uh, for me i've got students both in the us and and brazil there's different components to my talk today um, the main component is uh, to get a good understanding of what road ecology really is and my reflections on whether i think the practice but also our research is actually on the right track or if we change certain things and the final part of my talk is directed at uh, acknowledging opportunities and hopefully instilling um, a degree of optimism among yourselves hey marcel i'm sorry to um bug you um the, the go to meeting panel is covering a portion of your powerpoint slides can you hit that little it's like a red arrow on the side of the there thank yeah. you that looks much better is that it yep it looks you're good really okay it, it looks like it's in the center now but is that not true no so we can just see your powerpoint slides now the okay the, excellent. Excellent. okay thank you right. no worries so this is what the world looks like um, with roads so the darker an area is the higher the concentration of roads so roads are almost everywhere they are relevant almost everywhere there are impacts almost everywhere and there's only a few regions such as the the arctic in north america and, and eurasia the amazon the, the sahara central asia central australia where we have no or very few roads and these are really extremely important areas because if we do not have reference areas, we cannot understand what the impacts are of roads and traffic on our natural environment. So we have to be very, very careful with these last areas that have a low density of roads. Now, what is road ecology? Road ecology operates in the intersection between civil engineering on one side, where we deal with infrastructure and the traffic that uses our infrastructure, and on the other side, we have ecology. We have living organisms and their interactions among themselves and the physical environment. In that intersection between civil engineering and ecology, that is where road ecology resides. Now, historically, we have been mostly concerned with our own safety. If we hit large animals on the road, we typically end up with a vehicle that needs repair. And in some cases, there's also human injuries and even human fatalities. So we've been interested in road ecology, mostly because of our self-interest, at least in the beginning. When we look at this graph, we see the horizontal axis between 1990 and 2004. And we first look at the dark line up above. That's the total number of crashes per year in the United States that is recorded in these databases which has remained relatively stable at about 6 million per year. We then look at the line down below, the gray line, that is a subset of this data. It is the wildlife vehicle crashes, and it's a different um, axis. It's a different uh, order of magnitude. But what it shows is that wildlife vehicle collisions have been increasing in absolute numbers, about 50%. And because the total number of crashes remains relatively stable, the total percentage of uh, wildlife vehicle crashes as part of the total number of crashes has been, has been increasing. So there's more wildlife vehicle collisions over time, and they form a greater and greater percentage of the crashes um, that are still occurring on our roadways. When we estimate how many of them are happening with large mammals, we come at an estimate of about one to two million a year with common large ungulates in the United States alone of the year. So pretty high numbers. And these are very recent data from uh, just a few months ago. And I asked myself the question, okay, wildlife view collisions are increasing in the United States um, and other parts of the world as well. But as we are having more modern cars that cost a lot of money, and uh, a lot of safety features, are our cars actually getting safer when we hit an animal is the outcome better for people the animals typically will be dying but what about the people there's a graph on the left which is for deer a graph on the right which is for moose 
and you see the different symbols. The different symbols relate to different um, human injury and human fatality categories, as well as property damage only. That's the, that's the black triangle. Now, if we first look at the graph on the left-hand side, if there's a line in between these symbols, it means that the slope significantly deviates from zero, which means there is a change. There is a significant trend. Now, if you look at that black triangles, you see that there's a positive slope. The right, the line goes up towards the right, which means the proportional collisions that we have for the deep that result in property damage only, actually there is a significant increase. Whereas with the open circles, we have non-capacity capacitating injuries on a slight decline, as well as the black squares, incapacitating injuries, also a significant negative trend. So what we have here is we have a reduction in the proportion of collisions with deer that result in human injury, and we have an increase in the proportion of collisions with deer that result in property damage only. When we look at the graph for moose on the right-hand side, we basically see the same pattern. So the answer is, indeed, um, we see that the outcome of collisions for people is uh, less damaging as time progresses, presumably because our vehicles have been getting safer. Now, it is important to realize that there's a difference between statistically significant, which we have with these lines here, and, um, and what are, is substantial or not. These changes are quite subtle. So even though these changes are significant, they're not necessarily substantial. Now, the flip side is, what does it mean for wildlife? We typically differentiate between five different types of effects. When we build a road, we take up space. This is no longer available for animals to live in, for plants to grow. This is loss of habitat. It's pretty obvious, but we typically forget about it. The second type of effect is, well, we have dead animals, because if animals cross the same surface that we drive on, we end up hitting a number of them, and most of the ones we hit actually die. Then we have the barrier effect. If we have a landscape without roads, animals roaming that landscape, there's a certain probability to end up at a certain distance away from their current location. If we build roads in between, the probability that they will reach that original location decreases. So the roads are a barrier to their movements. They shy away from it. They don't even try to cross it. But the ones that don't try to cross cannot end up as roadkill. The fourth type of effect is a decreasing habitat quality. It can be all sorts of parameters. It can be associated with human presence and disturbance. It can be air, water, and soil pollutions. Um, it can be sound, noise. It radiates from this road, any road, into the surrounding area. Depending on the parameter that you're looking at, and depending on the species that you're evaluating the effect for, this effect zone can be a few feet up to several miles wide. So that really puts it in perspective. It's not just the habitat that we take that is uh, not much to wildlife, but it's a, a, a very wide zone depending on the species, depending on the parameter adjacent to the roads that is negatively impacted. The final impact is the edge, the zone between the edge of the pavement and the right-of-way fence. Typically, we build up a roadbed, a non-native substrate, we have disturbed hydrology, and we may even have actively introduced non-native plant species to withstand um, a frequent mowing regime for the clear zone, for example. So in this habitat adjacent to the road, it's heavily disturbed, and this is why non-native species can be plants, but it can also be certain um, wildlife species, invertebrates, small mammals, that can benefit from that. And they can spread alongside the road corridor, as a non-native species, and they can also be invasive if they move from the right-of-way into the surrounding areas. Now, I marked road mortality and barrier effect in red because most of our efforts related to highway mitigation are directed at reducing direct road mortality and are improving our own safety by not having these collisions occur. 
and by alleviating the barrier effect. But if we do that, and if we are successful, it doesn't mean that we have addressed all of the negative impacts of roads and traffic on wildlife. Not good, it's not bad, it's just important to realize. This is what our highways uh, look like. Um, in the United States, we get quite a few deer, both white-tailed deer and mule deer. In other parts of the world, it can be significant to be larger African elephants here. Um, maybe if we hit those, there will be a significantly higher risk to uh, human safety. But there's also species that are rare or threatened. These species are in Brazil. I've done quite a bit of work in Brazil. Maine wolf, jaguar, ocelot, giant anteater. These are threatened and endangered species, and they are killed on roads as well. And when we hit them, it may not be in large quantities. It may not even be large enough for us to experience substantial vehicle damage, but the impact to wildlife can be disastrous. It is an unnatural source of mortality um, imposed upon a threatened species. So when we take action to reduce collisions with wildlife, it is important to realize that we have two different potential departure points. If we are concerned about our own safety, it is logical to identify and prioritize road sections where we are hitting common large mammals. Large, because they're large enough to result in vehicle damage and pose a threat to our own safety, and common because it happens frequently. So this on the left-hand side is California, and in red, we have concentrations of where we are hitting black-tailed deer, a subspecies of mule deer. And in blue, there's significant uh, cold spots, meaning there is a lower than expected, based on random, concentration of collisions. So if you want to make it safe for people by having them hit fewer deer, large mammals, common large mammals, you would be taking action in the areas that are marked in red. Now look at the same state, California, but now the map on the right-hand side. We have marked where there are large blocks of natural landscape, natural vegetation, and also corridors connecting them. Now there's two things that are obvious if you compare the two maps. The collisions with common large mammals are not necessarily in the same areas where we have large areas of natural vegetation or the corridors connecting them. Also, there are many more road sections bisecting these areas that are important to biological conservation compared to the road sections that, where we are hitting a large number of deer. So it is important to recognize that your departure point really matters. And if you take action primarily based on human safety, there will be benefits for biological conservation but you will not address all of the road sections where we have impacts on biological conservation. And this is important because if we use human safety as a departure point, we, that doesn't mean that we have addressed all concerns related to these collisions, especially not for species that are rare or species that are small. Now I talked about identification and prioritization of road sections where we might want to consider taking action, for example, because of hitting animals. Well, if we have an identification and prioritization process, then the logical conclusion is that we go to work with that list. We look at what is highest on our ranking and start working on addressing the problems there. But that's not what typically happens. In reality, we say, okay, if we want to reduce collisions and maybe also provide connectivity for wildlife, well, it is kind of expensive to do it on a road section um, as a standalone mitigation measure. It is far less expensive, for example, to putting an underpass if you're ripping up the road um, for reconstruction already. So why don't we just look at road sections that we are reconstructing? And then we look at how high of a priority that is and then maybe if it's not a very high priority, we decide to do nothing because it's not a high priority. And that means that for the next 40, 60 years, however long it takes for us to revisit that road section again with reconstruction, it means that we basically decided for half a century or more to do nothing there. It also means that the identification and prioritization process is really limited because 
we are not actually acting on our prioritization list. We are acting on other parameters. And in the end, we're not doing very much and we're missing opportunities. So this is a change that I think we need to consider. If we have an identification and prioritization process, we should act on that. Another change is, well, what do we do? I mentioned the word mitigation a number of times. Mitigation essentially means reducing, reducing impacts. We have a green blob here that is a hypothetical habitat or a hypothetical species and a road going through it. It is on the road surface and in the road effect zone that we have impacts. It is only there where we have impacts that we can reduce the impacts, right? So that is our mitigation. Our mitigation is limited to the road and the road effect zone. The point I want to make is that mitigation is not the first nor the only step we should be thinking about. The mitigation hierarchy is a three-step approach that starts with avoidance. Do we need a road? Considering the impacts, including for biological conservation, do we have alternatives, alternative modes of transportation? Do we have an alternative route? where we can avoid most of your impacts. It is really important to consider these things in the earliest planning phases and to make it part of the purpose and need statement. If we do not do that, we can never avoid the most of your impacts. You're always stuck with mitigation. Now, it may be that there's still a need to mitigate. So it is not that you avoid or mitigate. You can have both. And there can even be a third step, and that is compensation or off-site mitigation, where you might consider enlarging existing habitat patches for a species, creating new habitat patches, and improving the connectivity between them. And this will result in a larger population size with a greater population persistence, so less likely to experience extirpation. So it's not just about mitigation. It's a three-step approach, avoidance, mitigation, compensation. You don't have to choose between these three. You can have any combination. Now, if we decide to take action, whether it's avoidance, whether it's mitigation or compensation, it's very important to be highly critical throughout this process. What is our problem? What do we set out to solve? And it is important to realize that there is all sorts of sidetracks, deviations, pitfalls, that it's very easy to make these missteps. So even though we have our problems, we also have desires. Our solutions, well, we would like for them to be simple, inexpensive, easily implemented tomorrow over long distances. And we're, we can, in some cases, be um, distracted by our desires to the point that we forget that the measures that fit that bill of desires, fit that list of desires, don't actually help us reach our objectives. On the other hand, the reality is that the mitigation measures or other types of measures that are likely to help us reach our objectives are actually complicated. They can be experienced as expensive. They're not necessarily easily implemented or fast. And certainly not everywhere, not tomorrow. And many people would label them as, well, that's not feasible. That's not realistic. But the main point I'm making here is that there needs to be consistency between our objectives and the proposed actions. If we propose actions that are predictably not having us meet our objectives, then we are silly. We're fooling ourselves. We're fooling everyone else. They must be consistent. So either we lower the ambition level, we change our objectives, or we go back to the mitigation measures that we consider actually effective in helping us reach our objectives and say, well, maybe it is not unfeasible. Maybe it is realistic. Main point, be honest and have the objectives be consistent with the proposed actions. Examples of mitigation measures that fill our uh, need to be simple, inexpensive, easily implemented tomorrow, a wildlife warning signs. Very numerous, almost everywhere across the world. The problem is that standard and enhanced wildlife warning signs do not actually reduce collisions. So if our objective is to reduce collisions, 
then this is not a measure, and I do not understand why we have them. We have them for other reasons, perhaps for liability, which is also kind of silly, and I'll talk about it in the Q&A session, because if they're not effective, then how can you be considered um, not informing the public appropriately if you don't have these signs? It's silly. Um, it's only when signs become more specific in time and location. For example, with seasonal wildlife warning signs for seasonal migration sites, or ungulates, for example, in the West, or animal detection systems where you have technology that detects animals real time, on or near the road, and then activates warning signs and tells drivers there's an animal on or near the road right here, right now. Then we have evidence that it can be several dozens of percentage effective in reducing collisions. And with animal detection systems, it's highly variable, but it can be almost 100%. Now, another set of mitigation measures that fits our desires is why don't we just reduce the posted speed limit? Surely, if we drive less fast, we had fewer animals. Well, speed management, maybe as many of you know, is actually quite complex. There's really three types of speed. First of all, we have the design speed. So if we decide how fast we want to travel from point A to point B, we go to work and design a road. Certain lane width and shoulder width, curvature, sight distance. This goes into allowing us to drive a certain speed. The posted speed limit is typically a little bit lower than the design speed. And that is what we are allowed to drive legally. Operating speed is the speed we actually drive. Now, it turns out that when we have an operating speed, it is more consistent with the design speed of a road, what feels safe to drive, given the conditions, rather than what we are legally allowed to drive. This is important to bear in mind. So it is important to have the posted speed limit be quite close to the design speed. That is considered good practice. If we do not do that, if we substantially lower the posted speed limit below the design speed, some people will adhere to the legally posted speed limit that is very low and inconsistent with the design speed, but most of us will continue to drive at the high speed consistent with the design speed. So now we've got a mixture of slow and fast moving vehicles on the same road, irritated drivers between behind slow vehicles that may have irresponsible overtaking, head-on collisions. Now, remember, we're trying to make it safer, right? But that's not what is happening if you have speed dispersion. We actually have an increase in crashes. So my main point is managing speed as a main tool to reduce collisions is not suited for our roads, not unless we also substantially reduce the design speed, which affects uh, the main purpose of a road, which is safe and efficient fast transportation between A and B. We'll explore that a little bit more. So I indicated that our desires are strong. So even though we have all this knowledge, we still have a desire to try it because it must work. We want it to work. Well, here we participated in a study in Wyoming. Nighttime speed limit reduction was reduced from 70 to 55 miles an hour. We found that indeed, people do reduce their speed, but only by three to five miles an hour, not the legally required 50 mile an hour speed limit reduction. More importantly, there was no significant change in collisions, predominantly with new vehicles. So it's not effective. It fits our list of desires, but it doesn't help us reach our objective. Now, if you still want to stick with a lower vehicle speed, as a main tool to reduce collisions with large wildlife, then the logical question is, well, what should we aim for? How fast do we want people to drive and still expect a substantial reduction in collisions? Well, it's a complicated graph, but I'll try to walk you through it. On the horizontal axis, we see the speed of a vehicle in miles an hour. The vertical axis has the stopping or detection distance in meters. Now, we first look at the horizontal lines. They relate to low beams in brown and high beams, lights of vehicles in blue. Let's assume we're on a rural road and that we cannot use our high beams because there's a truck coming from the other side. So we are stuck with our low beams. And if we look at the dashed line at about 70 meters distance on the vertical axis, 
that is 50% of the people can see a moose in the dark first at about 70 meters distance. Half of the vehicles have headlights that are so poor that half of the drivers still do not see it. But they are actually at a closer distance to the moose when they first observe it. But let's go with that median. So 70 meters. We have 70 meters to process the information. There's an animal on the road. It takes us on average about one and a half seconds to realize what we need to do and start touching the brake. In that time, one and a half seconds, we have come closer to the animal. And now there's reduced distance, smaller, shorter than the 70 meters to bring the vehicle to stop. Now we start braking. And of course, our original speed influences how long it takes for us to come to a stop. But it tells us that curved line is where it intersects the median beams is that we can only have a speed of 40 miles an hour for half of the people to avoid hitting the meat moose, assuming that we will not depart our lane, assuming that the moose does not leave the lane. Half of the people though will still hit the moose because they didn't see it early enough. So 40 miles an hour, that is about half of the design speed of most of our rural highways. So that would result in substantial deviation between legal posted speed limit and the design speed of our highways. And it would affect the fast and efficient transportation or the safe and efficient transportation uh, main purpose of our rural highways. So my point is, we cannot expect speed management to be a effective tool that substantially reduces wildlife vehicle collisions on our rural highways at least not for our through roads, perhaps for park roads where efficient transportation is not the main purpose. The main purpose of a park road is to be and experience a place, being a place. Um, but for our, most of our rural highways, it is not a suitable measure. I'm happy to chat about that with you later. What is effective? If we want to reduce collisions, we basically have to deny animals physical access to roads, so barriers, fences. Left-hand side, this is what a standard ungulate fence looks like. But if we have other species that we want to keep off the road, including amphibians, we might want to have uh, plastic screens, black screens on the right-hand side attached to the fence. If there's coyotes and badgers, smaller mesh sizes above that. And maybe above three feet, we have a larger mesh size up to a total height of eight feet, keep the large ungulates off the road. So depending on the species, you start designing a fence and you can design a fence to keep multiple species and multiple species groups out of the road corridor. Now, how effective are these fences in reducing collisions, in this case with large mammals? On the horizontal axis, we see the rope length that is fenced, this fence on both sides of the road. On the vertical axis, we see the percentage reduction in collisions with large mammals. So we're almost always able to reduce collisions 80 to 100% if our rope length that we fence is five kilometers or three miles at a minimum. Below that rope length, below three miles or five kilometers, our average effectiveness drops from 80 to 100% to 50%. And it's going to be extremely variable, low as zero and as high as nearly 100% effective in reducing collisions. Now, this is because of fence and defects. This is where animals can get in between fences, and when they're hit, they're typically hit close to the fence ends. If you have a short road section, maybe the entire road section is under influence of the fence end, and it is suppressed in its effectiveness. It's only when we make the fence road section longer that we dilute this fence end effect. It is still present, but if we dilute it, because we have a long distance that we now fence, the overall effectiveness of the road section that we treated with the fence is still high, 80 to 100%. Now, fences alone would result in an absolute barrier, of course. And we know that smaller populations, isolated populations, they have a higher risk of extirpation, disappearing from the landscape altogether. That is why it's important that we keep connectivity, that we allow animals to cross from one side of the road to the, state, to the other side of the road. There's no set standard or category 
system for different types and dimensions of crossing structures. But this is what my colleagues and I typically use, different types and dimensions of crossing structures. Now, these crossing structures are expensive. Depending on the dimensions, it may be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or many millions of dollars per structure. So why don't we just have a gap in the fence at different locations and have some roadway lighting, maybe some calming measurements and speed limit reduction and you know maybe a traffic speed camera or, or a police officer at all these locations. Um, I understand that that would be less expensive, but it doesn't alleviate the barrier effect. And this graph explains it. On the horizontal axis, we have increasing traffic volume and on the vertical axis, the probability that elk that are wearing a GPS collar and it has come within a quarter mile of a road end up on the other side of the road. Let's first look at the black circles. We see that at low traffic volume, left side of the graph, we have nearly 80% probability if an elk comes within a quarter mile of a road, it is 80% probability that it will end up on the other side with low traffic volume. But now we move further to the right, increase our traffic volume with those black circles, we see an exponential decrease in the probability that the elk will end up on the other side of the road. So basically, more vehicles means reduced probability that the elk will even try crossing the road. Now look at those black triangles up above. This is where we have fences and crossing structures. Essentially, the probability that elk will end up on the other side of the highway is not affected by our traffic volume. It remains 70, 80% probability, regardless of how many vehicles we have on this road. So my point is, yes, we need underpasses and overpasses. Yes, we need to physically separate wildlife from traffic, because if we don't, even though we allow a gap in the fence and we say, well, this is where they can cross, they don't uh, have high traffic volume resulting in a barrier effect and an animals not wanting to cross the road. Are these crossing structures actually being used? Uh, yes, these data come from um, the Flathead Indian Reservation, Highway 93 in Montana. Uh, tens of thousands per year, over five years, nearly 100,000 successful crossings through 29 structures of 20 uh, different wild, medium and large mammal species, including threatened or endangered species like grizzly bears. But this is just use and it's not necessarily effectiveness because in order to conclude whether we are effective or not, we have to have some sort of reference or goal, uh, objective. This is just numbers and what is a high number to me might be a low number to you and there's nothing really else to discuss. And let's illustrate that in the next few slides. But before we go there, um, we, we actually have a lot of knowledge collected over time about what type and dimension of crossing structure is suited for what species. In this table, each column represents a different type and dimension of crossing structure, ranging from overpasses to big bridges to smaller uh, pipes. And each line represents a different species. And when a cell has a black dot in it, it means that we consider that type and dimension of crossing structure suited for that species. An open circle means, well, it's not ideal, it's marginal, but some of them will use it. And we have a cross, it means don't even try that. Uh, that is ridiculous, uh, it's completely unsuited for that species. So that means that we have quite a bit of knowledge. If you know for what species we need to provide connectivity for, we can generally provide you with advice on what type and dimension of crossing structure is associated with that. When we start measuring wildlife use in crossing structures, we find that crossing structures are used more readily in higher numbers by animals over time. There's a learning curve. On the horizontal axis, we see the age of the crossing structures. And on the vertical axis, the number of year crossings in thousands on the left and black bear crossings in hundreds on the right. So when we start off, we have built a crossing structure and in the first year, over 29 structures combined, we had over 4,000 successful crossings by white-tailed deer and mule deer, and a few hundred crossings by black bear. 
But in the second year, the second year after construction, the numbers were higher. And in almost every year, every year that the structure gets older, the absolute use increases. And especially for deer, you start seeing that learning curve. After five years, we haven't reached an asymptote yet. But perhaps after seven or eight years, if we project that line out, we would reach an asymptote where we no longer have an increasing absolute crossings per year. Now, why is this relevant? It means that we have to be patient when we have crossing structures perform and deliver on connectivity. If we measure only in the first few years, by definition, we will have lower use by animals compared to say structures that are five years old or 10 years old. And depending on your objectives, you might draw different conclusions. If you only have data for the first few years, you are less likely to have reached your objectives compared to when you measure up to five years or up to 10 years. Now, another way to look at how these crossing structures perform is to look at how many animals cross successfully before and after mitigation measures were implemented. In this case, it's deer on the left-hand side, white-tailed deer and mule deer combined, and black bear on the right-hand side. What we see here is that we have actually a significant increase in the number of deer that used the crossing structures after a highway was reconstructed, after we built fences, and after the animals could only cross where we have underpasses or overpasses. The before situation, they could cross anywhere because there's no fences. So we physically restricted the road length where they can cross only at the crossing structures, which is a small percentage of the total road length. And even though it's smaller, that percentage that's permeable to any animals, we still see almost a doubling of the number of successful crossings. We see the same pattern for black bear on the right-hand side, but presumably because the absolute numbers are in the hundreds rather than the thousands, and we always have some, some variability in the data, it's not quite significant. Now, of course, this is dependent on how many crossing structures you build, whether they're suited to type and dimensions for the target species. But my main point is, that you can actually increase connectivity compared to an unmitigated highway. Yet another way to look at the effectiveness of crossing structures is to put cameras at an underpass. You see that in the center of this image, and also cameras in the surrounding landscape, in this case, up to 300 meters away. Now, this is an area very close to the road, 300 meters away, so it only detects animals that are willing to come close to the road species and individuals that are not willing to come close to the road cannot be helped by providing underpasses and overpasses. They can only be helped by not having a road at all, right? So if we build crossing structures, they can only serve animals and species, individuals and species that are willing to come close to the road. We cannot help with that measure species that are not willing to come close to the road. So this gives us a measurement in the immediate surroundings at random locations. What do our wildlife movements look like at random locations close to the road? What if we compare that to that underpass? Turns out we're actually concentrating animal movements at the underpass, but 146% large mammal movements more than at the random location in the surrounding area. Great news. They're not avoiding these crossing structures. They're actually concentrating in them. But in order to have the same level of movement that takes place in the surrounding areas, up to 300 meters away, we would have to mitigate 41% of the road length. That's not typically what we do. We may provide a large mammal underpass maybe once every one or two miles, uh, rather than um, have 41% of the road length be permeable with these crossing structures. So even though it's good to have these crossing structures, it doesn't get close to providing the level of connectivity that is present in an area adjacent to the highway. It helps us put our um, connectivity into perspective, right? And to what degree do we actually address the problem? So you're starting to get an understanding that it is important to define what the problem is and what success looks like. Only then can we evaluate and measure effectiveness and then perhaps have adaptive management if we are not quite happy yet. If we do not define success, if we don't have specific objectives, we can never conclude whether we reach those objectives 
we can never conclude how successful we are and if we need to make adaptations still. Also, when we sit at a table with different stakeholders, we often think or assume that we all have the same definition of success. We all assume we have the same ambition levels, but that's not necessarily true at all. There may be stakeholders that are legally required to build a crossing structure, and their success parameter is getting it built, regardless of whether that crossing structure is actually in the right location, has the right type, dimensions, or the target species, and whether the target species will actually use them to the level that is necessary to address our objective. Others might want to see substantial wildlife use, others might want to see viable wildlife populations that are sufficiently connected. So we have a larger connected population with a reduced level of extirpation and disappearing from the landscape. Others may say it's not about individual species, it's about whole ecosystems. Others may say it's also about ecological integrity. We've got migrating ungulates in our landscape over hundreds of miles. Regardless of population viability, we want to keep that migration. It's an integral component of, of, of our ecosystem. So we have to provide for these migration routes across our infrastructure and others might be focused on climate change. So it's important to have agreement with your stakeholders. What's the parameter of success? What is our ambition level? And it's not just about building these structures. Here we have a, the upper row related to underpasses, the lower row related to overpasses. On the left-hand side, we see structures that do not have any cover do not have any natural vegetation or soil. In the middle, we see some habitat provided, some soil, some vegetation, and on the right-hand side, big viaduct, and also an overpass in Argentina, um, where we see that, well, even if you're a large mammal, you might not even realize you're going under or over a road. Now, this is important, especially for the smaller species. They have an image of a salamander on the upper right. A salamander may take up to a few weeks to get across a motorway through a underpass or overpass. So this is the opposite of you know, contrast to a large mammal where it may take 30 seconds, right? So a salamander needs everything it needs to live on and in the crossing structure. It needs full habitat, it needs cover, it needs food, it needs water. If we don't provide that, then by definition, these small species that have small movement capabilities and don't move much at night, maybe 10 meters at the most, they will never benefit from what we think we have provided. Now, let me take you um, to the frontiers of road ecology. You may think that we know a lot, and that's true. We do know a lot, but we don't know enough. And there's some basic things that we don't know much about at all. One of those things is wildlife jump outs. Wildlife jump outs basically allow animals that are caught in between the fences in the road corridor to escape. These jump outs allow animals to walk up to more or less the height of the fence and then jump down to the safe side. Now, the height should be low enough that they readily do that. It should be high enough for animals not to jump the other way because we don't want animals to end up in between the fences there. Now, there's this road section in Montana where we actually measured um, and put cameras on these wildlife jump outs. What we found is that 32% of the mule deer that showed up on top jumped down, which meant two out of three deer that showed up on top did not jump down, and they may have used another jump out at a later time, escape at the fence end or another gap in the fence, or they were hit by traffic. For white-tailed deer, it was even more dismal only 7% made use of these cross uh, these jump outs. So this is too low, I think, and I think almost everyone would agree on that because the longer an animal is in between the fence road, road corridor, uh, the, the, the longer the risk is there for a collision, both for uh, human safety and the animal's, um, animal's health. What we did in this case helped by uh, MDT, their personnel, their equipment, we lowered number of these jump outs to five feet exactly. Then we put a bar on top of the jump out and I'll show images in a moment. And we did this in an area with mule deer and also in an area with white tail. 
just the prototype of the bar. So the bar basically plays with the perspective of the animals. The idea is <clears throat> that animals that are on top step over this bar as a setback with a prototype of four inches and can take advantage of a low jump out height of five feet. Whereas animals wanting to jump in, which is not a desire, that's not what we want, they don't have enough space to land in front of that bar, they would have to clear that bar. So effectively the height is five feet plus the height of the bar, which is 18 inches, so six and a half feet. <laughs> what we found is that, well, animal mule deer jumps over, but it really, it doesn't put its feet on the other side of the bar. Effectively, it jumps down from six and a half feet rather than five feet. That's not exactly what we wanted. <clears throat> we eventually set on using the bar, which has to be pounded into the soil. And because there's these big center blocks that make up the walls, we had a setback of 12 inches, which was quite fortunate. We're still at a height of 18 inches. Do we see a mule deer? And if you look closely, it will put its hoofs, its legs over that bar, even a third leg in the rear, and then jumps down to the safe side. So that is what we want. But apparently four inches setback was not enough, 12 inches, that was better. We also had additional experiments where we had a greater setback, 15 inches rather than 12, and also reduced the height to 15 inches. Still was a setback of 12. So we have different treat at different treatments. Now we have a number of different species jumping up, jumping down. Let's only focus on deer to make it simple. Let's, let's start with mule deer, the second line. And we see that 64% jump down. That is regardless of the treatment, regardless of how high the bar was or what the setback was, we basically doubled the effectiveness from 32% to 64%. But for white-tailed deer, it was 7%. Now it's 5.5%. Essentially, there's no difference. So our treatments overall, made it much more suited for mule deer, but we basically did not make any improvement for white-tailed deer. This is what the different treatments look like for white-tailed deer. I use on the vertical axis the percentage of the animals that shows up on top and that ends up jumping down, which is very, very low. So this is not good enough. We need to have additional treatments It might be different height, different setback mount. I would please also be a different height of the, of the mount of the wall um, as a starting point. For mule deer, overall it's 64%, but there's one treatment where we actually reach 80%. So four out of five mule deer that are on top are successfully jumping down now. So I think this is great, and we have a good indication of what our jump out should look like to make a more super mule. There's also animals jumping up, clearing that bar. This is not what we want, but it's really about that balance. It is about maximizing or minimizing the number of deer that are staying inside the right of way. So if there's still more deer jumping out than jumping in, then there's still a benefit. So what did we find at this frontier of road ecology? Uh, we know that it was dismal, the performance of, of jump outs, the way they were constructed. We were able to improve but substantially double the effectiveness for mule deer. But we need additional experiments for white-tailed deer. There's an opportunity for you and your agency, perhaps, if you want to contribute. Uh, we are at the end of our project and we would like to continue to find uh, opportunities to make it better for white-tailed deer, the most common large ungulate in North America, certainly a species when we want to get out of the fence right away as soon as possible. Second frontier is wildlife guards, cattle guards, modified wildlife guards. What we see in this graph on the left-hand side, ungulates in red, mule deer, white-tailed deer, and on the vertical axis, permeability, low permeability. So these wildlife guards are great. They have a low permeability, very few mule deer and white-tailed deer walk across them and enter the fence road corridor. Great. But now look at the species with paws, the left, the right-hand side of the graph black bears, coyotes, mountain lions, high permeability. These animals can just walk over these wildlife guards, just like we do. So this is not what we want and we need a different solution. 
Electrified barriers are really where it is at. Um, on the, depending on the traffic speed and traffic volume that you have, you can have electrified barriers embedded in the road corridor. Uh, high volume, high speed, you might have a hundred thousand or more dollars per location. But what about low and medium traffic volume and speed? In a multifunctional landscape, we have many access points, and I circled them here in red. There's many access points for agricultural fields, dispersed houses. Now imagine having a few hundred thousand dollars per location. It's not going to happen, is it? So what we're trying is lower cost solutions for electrified barriers to address low volume, low speed locations. In this case, we set out on a melon farm, and I'll explain how it relates to transportation. These melons were a huge attractant to black bears, and there was quite a bit of loss. There were seven black bears at one time, at the same time, eating melons in the field. There was a fence erected around this melon patch, and there's four access points where vehicles need to access the field. And this is where transportation comes in. The electrical components have a voltage of about 10,000 volts. That is, this is what the fence looks like. It is a bare fence. It's not suited for ungulates. Deer and elk can easily jump it. So we're only looking at bears and keeping bears out. Now the access points, um, they have a swing gate. So that means animal people still need to get out of their vehicle and back into their vehicle, which is not ideal. We're electrified wires attached to it. Uh, more appropriate, not allowing or need requiring you to get out of your vehicle or drive over wires that are electrified. So you can just drive over them. That's the upper right. Lower left bump gates. Uh, these are horizontal poles and they're vertical electrified strands hanging from it. Rubber caps at the end of these horizontal poles that are on a string. If you bump against them, they will scrape along the side of your vehicle, suited perhaps for farm vehicles, not for public access, of course, because of damage to cars. On the lower right, a drive over mat is alternating positive and negative where animals continue to be shocked as they are traveling or would be traveling across this map. Now, a little bit more about these jump uh, bump gates. Here we have a black bear leaving the melon patch with a melon in its mouth. Um, we do know that they work, meaning electrified strands hanging from these horizontal bars, they, they deliver a shock. We see here an enlargement and we see a strand hanging on the nose of the bear as a melon in its mouth. The lower image, lower left, we see that the shock has been delivered, the animal has dropped the melon and jumps in the air. So it's not that these bump gates don't deliver electricity, they do do that. But what we saw is that bears will basically put their head in between the strands and avoid being shocked on the face. And then the strands can potentially shock them still on the flanks, but there's a lot of fur there, and it's not as sensitive as they're known. So in order to stop this behavior, we thought, well, we attach netting with electrified uh, metal wire in the netting. Now we force the bear to have more contact with the nose, which is very sensitive. And this proved to be a good move. This is what the different gates and, and uh, barriers uh, performed like. We want a high effectiveness of the barrier, 100%. Almost all of our treatments were at 100% or near 100%, except the bump gates that you know, came out of the livestock industry with vertical wires. It was only when we attached the netting that it became an absolute barrier for bears. So that's good news. But when we address those locations where vehicles could enter the patch, we started seeing evidence of bears digging under the fence. And there's a lot of creative movement associated with that. Here we have a bear leaving the melon patch, kicking with its right rear leg a melon as it crawls under. And slowly that melon rolls under the fence as well. And the bear picks it up and takes one for the road. We addressed those locations with lower wires, additional wires, and a few other things. So we were very aggressive about addressing these problem locations where bears were digging at the fence. Now, this is very relevant also to transportation corridors. And I'll explain that. In this graph, we see different time periods. Each bar represents a different time period. When we switch to a different time period, the second bar, we have changed something to one of the gates or the fence. 
So what we see here on the left hand side, the first bar, uh, we start out with having a total of almost three intrusions per day by these black bears into the melon patch. And it happens mostly at a fence location, but also at access point number four. Then we make a change, we get to the second bar and really there's no change in what the bear is doing. We're not successful. They still enter at about three animals a day and at the same locations. Then we make another change. Now we see that access point number four, that light gray has disappeared. So that gate is now effectively a barrier, but the bears have increased the pressure on two fence locations and the absolute number of bears per day is now over four. Only when we address those fence locations did we see a drop, almost elimination of bears being able to access the fence. Now, what does this tell us? It tells us that it is a system and a roadway with fences and access points for vehicles and fence ends and underpasses and overpass, it is a system as well. And it's only as good as its weakest component. Therefore, it's important to critically monitor performance and have adaptive management in place. Now, it really affects animal behavior. Here we see the total number of black bears we observed, any camera inside or outside the patch in two years. In the first year, we had a lot of intrusions still, right? We're still figuring out how to keep the bears out. In one month in August in 2020, we had nearly 300 black bear observations, which is crazy. Um, and in that second year, black bars, it has almost disappeared, right? So we have 90%, 95% fewer black bear events in or outside the melon patch compared to the previous year. So what this means is that the bears know they can't get in and the bears no longer try. They don't even show up. And that is great because now we break the addiction, we change the behavior of the bear. Now, unfortunately, the last year, Armour took it over and everything fell apart. So it basically shows that consistent monitoring and critical adaptation, adaptive management is essential. And if we don't do that, then everything we build will be in vain. Now we have proceeded since then by bringing these electrified barriers to a highway and access points along a highway that are accessible to the public. This is what one of the designs looks like, and this is what another design looks like. Now, of course, these highway access points are not melon patches, meaning they're not as much of an attractant to bears, which means we have lower numbers. But we do have people, and we have to provide warning signs for people because you know, 10,000 volts, of course, it's, it's, it's alternating um, uh, current, it's pulsating, I'm sorry, it's pulsating, and uh, that means that your muscles won't seize, similar to a uh, fence, right? But still, you'll, you'll, you'll notice this shock, and it's low amps as well. That makes it relatively safe, though very intense. Now, if you have bare feet, if you don't have insulated soles, or if you're riding a horse, you definitely want to press this button. It turns off the electricity for one minute, and it automatically again. I mentioned we don't have a lot of bears, so we have a small sample size and we run out or close to running out of time on our project. Again, it's something that you can contribute to if you want to and contact me if you're interested. Now back to some other changes that I think are needed. When we have a road project and consider mitigation measures along this road, we are typically confined to a line in the landscape. A traditional road project is a line in the landscape, but ecological phenomena take place in the landscape. So this is a conflict. Uh, we have a, a project level that is a line in the landscape with a problem and a solution that is landscape based. How do we deal with that? Well, it is really a matter of regulations and also culture and perhaps changing culture. Others have done it. Now this comes from the Netherlands, where already at the end of the 1980s, the Ministry of Nature Management identified large tracts of natural vegetation, nature areas, and corridors connecting. 
then in the 1990s, they basically plotted, well, where do these, this, road, uh, this road network and railroad network intersect with the nature net? These are our problem locations. And even though mitigation were measures were implemented already in 1970s and 80s and in 90s, really yes, from the early 2000s onward, there was a high degree of coordination, national government, provincial government, local government, and in a very organized fashion and a local uh, logical uh, pattern addressing all of these problem locations. So it, it is not a physical impossibility. It is a bureaucratic problem that uh, if, if we keep working on a project level that is treated like a line in the landscape, others have been able to do this on a landscape level, even at a national level. Now, what do these crossing structures look like? In this case, it's all overpasses. Upper left, root pods leading up to an overpass suited for large mammals, but also the root pods provide microhabitat shelter um, for small animal species, invertebrates, amphibians, reptiles, small mammals. Upper right, we see a berm on an overpass over a motorway, reducing sound and, and light disturbance onto the center of the overpass. Lower left, we see an overpass in a flat landscape. Rather than asking the animals to walk up a slope and they can't see to the other side, what was decided here is to gradually lower the road over a distance of hundreds of yards and allow the animals to not change um, the, or, or not to walk on any slope. They can clearly see across the landscape. It's a flat landscape. And therefore, the approaches of an overpass should also be flat. And the same is true for an underpass. Lower right, we see a large overpass. This is actually across a two-lane road, a two-lane railroad, a railroad yard, and a field hockey complex, half a mile long in total, uh, 50 meters wide at a minimum. And it's combined with a non-motorized trail, meaning a non-motorized recreation on this trail combined with wildlife use. So we talked a lot about human safety. We talked about biological conservation, but many of them of us will say, well, what about the cost? And isn't it too costly? Or maybe some of you are convinced that it is crazy to spend any money on these types of measures. My argument is, well, it's not about absolute cost. It's always about, well, you pay something, but what do you get in return? And really, is there no cost to doing nothing? Isn't that a falsehood? So in 2009, we had a paper published that examined this. It's really about the balance of costs versus benefits, costs of mitigation measures, and benefits in this case of reducing collisions. So we estimated for clear elk and moose, the most commonly hit large ungulates in North America, what does it cost to repair your car after you hit one? It's a bigger animal, there's more damage, more vehicle repair costs. Occasionally, there'll be human injuries and human fatalities. It's a small percentage, but when it happens, a high dollar amount. We don't know which collision results in human injury and human fatality. Therefore, we allocate a portion of those high dollar amounts to each deer and each elk and each moose vehicle collision. And of course, the larger the animal is, the higher the probability that there will be human injuries and human fatalities. And that's why the dollar values increase with the size of the animal. And in total, you now we have $6,600 for an average deer view collision and with larger animals it gets into tens of thousands of dollars. And these are the dollar values that we can potentially save when we have fewer collisions. We also reviewed, well, what do these mitigation measures cost? Then we conducted the cost benefit analysis over a 75 year long time period. If you build mitigation measures, especially overpasses, concrete structures, most of the costs are in year one, but the benefits are obtained over the entirety of their lifespan, and their lifespan is 75 years or so. We also recognize that we have discount rates, meaning a dollar amount that you spend today, a dollar you spend today on mitigation, that dollar is worth more than a dollar that you would earn back tomorrow because of a condition that didn't happen. Then we brought it back to real roads. This is a road section in Montana. On the horizontal axis, we see the miles. This is the road, 
mile marker zero until mile marker 45 or so. And on the vertical axis, we see dollar amounts per kilometer per year. Let's first look at the jacket line. This is based on real carcass data, large mammals that were collected along this real road. And then we calculated, well, what's the cost per kilometer per year associated with all these carcasses? And that's the jacket line. And especially in the first 50 miles or so, the costs are pretty high. We're hitting a, a large number of large mammals. Horizontal lines are thresholds for different types and combinations of mitigation measures. Now, wherever that jacket line meets or exceeds the horizontal lines, we're actually experiencing more costs in terms of collisions than we would have had in costs associated with mitigation. Now, this is really interesting because it really changes the discussion from, well, this costs too much money and it's just a statement and an opinion, to the realization that it actually costs money to do nothing and it can be less costly to society to implement effective mitigation measures compared to not taking any action. Now, it was published in 2009 in 2007 dollars, and just a few months ago, we had an update of this analysis. We found that, for example, for deer, the total cost is now 14,000 rather than 6,600 based on human injury, human fatality, and vehicle repair costs. So a substantial increase in cost and therefore savings if we can reduce collisions. We also expanded the model with passive use values, and that basically is a parameter related to biological conservation, recognizing that there's a value for the animals as well. What are people willing to pay to not have the animals die? What are the people willing to pay to not have animals disappear from a region? Now, this $5,000 for a common white-tailed deer, and then you know, basically a quarter of the total amount, $19,000. Now, look at the fifth column, grizzly bear. In size and weight, on average, they are similar to deer. So we have $14,000 in cost associated with vehicle repair, human injury, human fatality. But it's a threatened and endangered species, extremely charismatic. A lot of money has been spent on trying to recover this species from the brink of extirpation in the lower 48, over $4 million per individual. Basically, we know this intuitively, hitting a grizzly bear is much worse for biological conservation than hitting a white-tailed deer. Now, ethically, we're still killing animals, of course, but there's far fewer grizzly bears and we really can't afford to hit this rare species. Every individual matters and unnatural mortality should really be avoided. Now, this is really interesting. We'll explore that a little bit more. Well, we also updated the costs associated with mitigation measures, fences, underpasses, overpasses. So this all went into it. Then we conducted these cost-benefit analysis, we calculated thresholds, and each column, um, let's, let's look at uh, where that upper red circle is. We have a fence, we have an underpass once every two kilometers and jump outs. We have a value of 1.5 in that red circle there. That means we need to have 1.5 deer hit per kilometer per year in order for that combination of mitigation measures to pay for itself. Now compare that to the 2009 publication in $2,007. We basically find that we now have a threshold that is half that, meaning we now realize with the update and expansion of the model that we should have, could have justified implementing mitigation measures much sooner along many more sections of roadway. And that seems to be the trend. The more we know, the more complete we make these models, the more we realize we should have been implementing mitigation measures earlier. Now look at the lower right. This relates to grizzly bears and including an overpass every 24 kilometers. And we need overpasses for grizzly bears with sows and cubs. That is really what they need. Extremely low thresholds. That means that we only need to hit a few grizzly bears per kilometer per year or a fraction actually for these combinations of mitigation measures to pay for themselves. Can we bring that back to a real road? Yes. On the Flathead Indian Reservation in Western Montana, Highway 93, about 50 miles, 22 kilometers. For this calculation, I assumed one grizzly bear hit per year. In reality, since then, I've learned it's actually 1.6. So this is a conservative. If we do the calculations, then we 
actually find it economically defensible to build at least five large crossing structures in this road section of about 15 miles or so. So this really changes the discussion, right? Um, when we have these rare species, threatened species, these high passive use values, uh, it can be economically defensible, have enormous amounts of dollars devoted to mitigation. Now, getting towards the end of my presentation, uh, talked about human safety, biological conservation, also economics now. We haven't really talked about very much is climate change. We have a change in precipitation patterns. Uh, there's more extremes. And if we build a culvert based on 100 year hydrological data, we find that every five years we fail and we have a 100 year flood every five years. So we have to build them bigger. If we build them bigger, there will be reduced maintenance, reduced probability of road failure, which is unacceptable. And also, most of the time, there would be a riparian habitat and a dry zone for terrestrial animals. So it's good practice, I think, to make these crossing structures at creeks and rivers much bigger than you think you need based on historical data, because the historical data are no longer accurate. The lower right, recreation and physical and mental health. I hinted that that was one overpass from the Netherlands where there was this trail for non-motorized recreation. We know we need this. We also need access to nature for physical and mental health. We experienced that over the last few years with COVID. Um, so what if wildlife interest, biological conservation interests are combined with our recreational needs and the need to have physical and mental health? What if we combine forces? Maybe by not only focusing on wildlife, but also embracing recreation, we can build five structures in an area rather than just one, and in the end, be more effective. Now, this is not necessarily suited for all species. Uh, species that are dangerous to people or species that are extremely sensitive to human disturbance, they would still need their own structures without people. I think landscapes may be close to cities, suburban areas. We have species that are adapted to human presence and disturbance in the landscape already. Now, final consideration. I hope I um, illustrated that road ecology is not rocket science. Road ecology science is road ecology science. But the main point I want to make here is that um, common sense is not science, and it is easy to fall in pitfalls and not be effective and not be consistent. Common sense is convictions and belief. Common sense is not the same as science. Scientists basically help us figure out what's most likely true, what is most likely false, and what is most likely to help us reach our objectives. And we know we can address our objectives. We can help us achieve our objectives. It's not going to be easy. It requires knowledge, it requires experience. It requires us to be critically uh, evaluating what we put out there, critically evaluating ourselves, and continuous improving what we do. And with that, I'll hand it over to the moderator and hopefully initiate the Q&A session. Thanks, Marcel. The presentation was really interesting. Um, we have had a few questions come in. We probably have time for just one or two. Um, in your presentation, you talked a lot about landscape and road designs that can help reduce animal vehicle collisions. But as we start to see more in-vehicle technologies like automat automatic braking systems in the vehicle fleet, is there an expected benefit to reduce wildlife vehicle, uh, vehicle collisions? Yeah, I absolutely expect a benefit from in-vehicle technology. However, um, it's, it basically has been developed for pedestrians in urban settings and bicyclists, whereas our wildlife is in rural areas. And that means that we're driving at higher speed. That means that our sensors have to be able to detect wildlife at a greater distance than we currently detect our uh, people in the cities at. Because we're traveling at much higher speed, right? We need more distance in order to avoid the collision. Second thing is, some of the animals are not necessarily already present on the road. They may come in from the site within the detection range, thereby reducing our distance that we have. Some people even argue, I didn't hit an animal, the animal hit me. It ran into the side of the vehicle, right? So there's limitations there. Also, 
Another limitation is it's mostly suited for large mammals. So if you have small species, not necessarily human safety concern, but maybe a biological conservation concern, and salamander is not going to be detected by this onboard technology. Also, none of those species, large or small, are actually helped with the barrier effect of the rope. So there is a role and benefit for in, in vehicle uh, technology, but it is not going to replace um, the measures that I talked about, such as fences and underpasses or no fences. That makes a lot of sense. Um, thank you. So our next question is, um, they've heard that channeling wildlife to crossing structures can result in predators staking out these locations to ambush their prey. Um, thus, you kind of see this favoring of predators. Is that true? It, it is a concern that people often voice. And it has been investigated empirically a, a number of times through different means. For example, um, based on where animals, predators, cougars, wolves, kill animals. After road mitigation is implemented, did we find a change in location and uh, did we find a disproportionate number close to crossing structures? The answer is no. When we look at date and time stamps of cameras and then see how closely interaction is in time between prey species and predator species, do we see that there is a closer and closer um, you know, uh, coinciding in time uh, and thereby you know, basically indicating that these predators are tracking the wildlife and hanging out at the structures? The answer is no. And I think it can be explained as such. Um, a road corridor is disturbance and typically animals, uh, especially sensitive predators, large predators, they don't fare well with people and human disturbance. They don't want to be there longer than they need to be. Second of all, it would be an assumption that if they are present, these predators, at a crossing structure, that that is, yeah, it's true, it is better than a random location in the landscape. But these are predators with an evolution behind them, and they are incredibly capable. They are not hunting at random locations in the landscape. They know where the animals are and they know how to hunt it. Basically, my argument is, even though we funnel animals towards these crossing structures, it is po probably far poorer for a bear or a, a wolf or a, a cougar to be hanging out in a structure. They are far more effective hunting in the surrounding landscape because they are not ran hunting at random locations. All right, we probably have time for just one more question and then we'll wrap things up here. Um, what solutions have you proposed in rural areas where there are more dense, densely populated with farms instead of a more traditional wildland um, environment? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I wish I had a different answer, but the most effective and robust set of mitigation measures is always fences in combination with crossing structures. Of course, your access points are the main issue there, right? And that is why you know, one of the frontiers we're working at is, is these electrified barriers and especially reducing the costs of these electrified barriers. You know, I, I really wish I would have a different answer, but it is not there. And it is indicative though of our desires, right? Oh, this is too complicated. It's too costly. Uh, and there must be something else. Well, if there is something else indeed, we haven't identified it yet. And that is important to bear in mind because are we trying to actually address a problem at a location or are we more sensitive to our desires and are willing to do anything regardless of how effective it is? All right, thank you very Thank you, Marcel. Um, we do have a few questions remaining, so I will loop back with you afterwards to see if we can provide some response to folks. Um, I am going to run through a few slides here to wrap up the webinar today. Um, we did want to announce a couple of upcoming events so that you could save the date. The first is um, Rural Road Safety Awareness Week, where we held July 17th through the 21st, and we are going to be holding our fourth national summit on national National Summit on Rural Road Safety in Oklahoma City on September 12th through the 14th. And we will keep you all posted as more information becomes available about both of these events. Um, we are also holding several webinars for our Road Safety Champion Program. Dana, can you go to the 
next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> um, the first webinar, Core Module 7, that safety analysis process webinar, was previously scheduled back in the fall. However, that was postponed. It is now rescheduled. That one is happening Thursday, March 2nd from 2 to 4 Eastern. We will then be holding all seven core modules again this spring. So um, these will start on March 14th. The webinars will be held Tuesdays from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern, starting March 14th through April 25th. Um, and just wanted to note that mo core modules two and three are going to be held out of order. So if you go to register, um, just pay attention to the dates. Um, you can register for any of these webinars on our website at ruralsafetycenter.org. And we will be sending out an invite to our distribution list um, shortly. Um, and with that, I will leave you on the slide with our contact information. Please feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions for either the Safety Center or Marcel, and we will follow up with you. Um, Marcel, thank you again for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, have a great rest of your day, everyone.